Good morning, everybody. This is Meg Riley in freezing Minneapolis, Minnesota. If I've been saying it's unseasonably warm this year, I take it all back. It's going to be below zero for a while now. I asked for it. I'm hoping it kills some of the things that kill some of the plants. That's my only hope with it. Um, I'm very excited today to be welcoming a new learning fellow, and you'll be hearing more about her role here and a special guest and all of our hosts are here. So it's, it's a great day here. Let's start with Christina. Hi everybody. I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia, um, where we're getting over a super cold snap during which um, the water heater in our house, which heats our house because we have radiant floor heating, uh, was dead during the entire cold snap. Um, so I'm really happy it's starting to warm up <laughs> for many reasons. And of course, we got um, the replacement installed yesterday, just in time for the 57 degree weather today. Aisha. Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser and I'm in Seattle. Um, it has been unseasonably warm uh, and cro daffodils, crocuses. I I'm clearly not a gardener. One or both are coming up. Um, and I've never planted them. So they're like the never ending flowers, which is great. So thank you to the people who used to be in this house who planted beautiful things for me to see. So circle of life. Um, Michael, how are you? Good morning, everyone. It's Michael Tino here from Peekskill, New York, where it is, uh, it is raining here. And I'm very, very glad that this very heavy rainstorm is not snow. Um, so you can keep the cold over there in Minnesota, where it will kill your bugs. Um, we, we, we're through with our cold snap for now, and I'm sure there'll be another one, and the crocuses are pushing up through the ground, and um, I will let you all know when they start to bloom, because that is a holy day in the calendar of Michael Tino. Um, I am getting over the flu. I was out last week. Um, my child brought home some strain of the flu that this year's flu shot decided not to cover. Um, so everyone in the house had the flu last week, and it was really awful. And I'm just, um, I'm about 90% now, which is better than I've been every day a little more. Um, but it's good to be with you. And Jessica is out there on the West Coast. How are things? things? That's Reverend Jessica. Yeah. Oh, yes. Pardon me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm still exhausted from this weekend. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it feels even earlier than usual here. Um, things are good. I am on Facebook fielding your questions and comments. I'm on Twitter. And I'm also with Margalie Belazare, who is our one of our learning fellows at CLF. And um, as I transition out of this job, um, Margalie is going to be taking over. And Margalie is awesome and is one of my favorite people. So, Margalee, how are you doing today? And where are you? Hello. Um, well, as uh, Jessica has said, I'm Margalee Belazare, and I am coming to you from Norwalk, Connecticut today. I'll be in somewhere in Connecticut. Today is Norwalk. Uh, you know, next time it might be somewhere else in Connecticut. But I am so excited as, um, you know, Jessica transitions out, I transition in. I'm really excited to... Um, do tech here on, on view. So hello, everyone. And who do we go next to? We're good. We're good. Thank you, Margalee. Right. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about what's up in the UUA. I know that the board is starting to meet right now. And I just want to name that each week, those of us who are here benefit from the wisdom and leadership of Christina. And this is a very concrete cost of racism in our association that she is not at the board meeting. And she represents, she, you can see her face now if you're watching this, her face can represent so many people of color who have left. And, you know, we know how much she brings because we get to hear her every, every week here and be inspired and, and think and, you know, hear her faith and, and, what she brings to us. So I just wanna name that, Christina, it's very sad to me that you're not in that leadership position because you did it so well. I'm of course delighted that you're here and you would be on a plane otherwise, but um, I just wanted to name that as we start talking about what's going on in our association. Um, so I'll start with that. Who wants to name something else? Well, I appreciate that, Meg, um, a lot. It's um, 
been really difficult this morning waking up and seeing all of my colleagues. Um, you, usually, you know, we really try and amplify that the board is meeting and and how excited the board members are to to be doing that. This is one of the um, quarterly times that we meet together in person, um, which is at Boston. And so, um, you know, this morning I've been seeing my colleagues, you know, post about getting on the planes and being in Boston and. Um, and I, you know, I think back to, I had to develop a spiritual practice before the board meetings. When I first started the board, I was the only person of color on the board. And um, I really quickly realized that I needed to develop a spiritual practice to get me ready for that, which included um, going to a Puerto Rican restaurant in Boston. Like I would get off the plane, I'd go to the, the PR restaurant and have food that completely reminded me of everything I hold dear and kind of, you know, gird my loins <laughs> as I went into the UA board. And, I, and one of the things um, that I've just noticed that as time has gone on and, and the board culture has shifted, um, while I've stuck to that spiritual practice, I've, I needed it less and less in terms of uh, protection and more and more in terms of celebration. Um, so that was something that I really appreciated about um, this board and its transformation and where it's going. And, and so that I definitely um, hold that blessing, you know, for them as they go through their work um, because it, it is transformative. Um, but as we do it, we, we do lose people and um, that cost is really high, so. I appreciate being able to say that with you all and everybody who's listening and watching. Um, and part of that, you know, is speaking the truth about what our experience is. So um, Trust um, this week came out with a report that talks about what the transgender experience is in our congregations. Do you want to and, share what Trust is in case people oh, sure. don't know that? You know what? I'm not sure that I know their acronym properly because you know we all love our acronyms in UU. Um, so I'm just gonna look it up real quick. It's the trans. Oh, yeah, there it is. Um, the Transgender Religious Professional Unitarian Universalists Together. That's the trust. Um, and so they. Uh, did a study that that talked about what the trans. Uh, gender folks experiences in our congregations and it's um it's really well done it's um and the call to action in it is fantastic you know the and there is an executive summary if you don't want to read the whole report i encourage people to read that um but what i would say is you know for everybody that was preaching king this weekend um, they should be reading this report and doing every single one of the call to actions. Like we can't just say, um, you know, all the wonderful things that we want to say about Dr. King's work and then not turn around and pay attention when something like this, something this important comes um, and is just laid into our laps, you know, especially as we see the Supreme Court upholding the transgender ban um, earlier this week. So uh, shout out to Trust for all their hard work um, and, you know, get your hands on the report, read the report, take a look at it, see the ways in which you can be working on it, not just in your congregations. The call to actions are very easy to translate into everybody's everyday lives. What else is going on? Aisha, what's new in your neck of the woods? Um, so the UA nominating committee uh, finally completed its slate. I know that because I'm a member. Um, and uh, five people will be, um, or will be on the slate for the UA board. We populate six committees. So um, that happened and it got, you know, we made it public finally. Um, so that's exciting. At least I think so, <laughs> being one of the people that helped make the decision. Um, it's five new people, so it's almost half the board that'll be that'll be new. So that's what's happening, at least 
that's on my radar. And I just want to say Jessica's ordination was amazing. It looked really great from the miles away. Michael, anything to add to this from your world? Nothing, nothing particular that I have to add. I've sort of been under a rock the last week. So oh, yeah. I, 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 I'm learning about what's going on. I, the trust uh, report is, is comprehensive and uh, well done. And I also commend it to people. Mm. And not easy. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy. And, and anyone who's been you know, paying attention um, shouldn't be surprised at how not easy it is. Well, we'll have to get Trust back on to talk about that report, won't we? Margalee, you're just back from Meadville. What are the students talking about? What's going on there? Anything exciting? Huh, anything exciting? Um, wow, I, I think I'm still uh, re-entering <laughs> from, from being at Meadville for intensive. So I, I, my mind isn't um, that clear right now to uh, talk about anything specific, so. I okay. can't think of anything, Meg. All right. Well, keep us posted. I'm very excited about our guest this morning, Beacon Books, which is a subsidiary of the UUA and, and its own fabulous thing for many, many years, um, has started a, a series of uh, American history from different perspectives. And we're delighted to learn that Michael Tino is actually friends with one of the authors. So I'm going to have Michael introduce our special guest today. And very excited for this conversation. Good morning, everyone. So I'm excited to welcome Paul Ortiz to The View this morning. Paul is the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program and associate professor of history at the University of Florida. And uh, as Meg mentioned, the, new, the author of the brand new Beacon Press book, An African-American and Latinx History of the United States. And as it turns out, Paul and I were in graduate school together. Um, several decades ago at Duke, um, and uh, many of my uh, closest friends there were in the history department. So as a cell biologist, I, I hung out with historians all the time. And, and it's, um, it's been many years since Paul and I were in the same space, but it is wonderful to have you here today, Paul. And you're, and you're muted, so, um, so we're not actually hearing what you have to say. All right. Well, I was censored the first time through, Michael. I, you didn't want to hear what I had to say, but no, it's so great to be back in, in contact, you know, to think about those old uh, grad school days. And also, um, if you permit me, uh, we have a, in Gainesville, Florida, where it's uh, 75 degrees and sunny right now, you can probably tell in the back. Um, we have a wonderful um, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, which is really a critical part of our community, uh, very supportive of you know, radical, progressive, you know, politics, um, and just a welcoming place for for people. So we we feel very blessed to have UU as part of our part of our community. Well, I'm delighted to hear that. I know somebody in search is looking at that, and I was like, really, Gainesville? So I'm really yes. I'm happy to hear that it's uh, it's a lively win. So you want to tell us how you came to be the author of this Beacon book? I'm guessing. It is related to the history that you teach at the, at the university. It is, and, and listening to all of you talk about, you know, bearing witness, ongoing struggles, you know, within um, the organizations that we're a part of for, you know, equity, for justice, for equality. For me, the book comes out of my experience in the classroom, you know, teaching almost 20 years as a university instructor. and working with so many students of color, so many first generation students. I taught for seven years at UC Santa Cruz and many of my students were from Los Angeles or Oakland or Sacramento. Um, they were first gen students, many of them uh, Mexican American or Central American. Now I teach University of Florida and a lot of my students are first gens from, you know, uh, uh, Haitian American backgrounds, Cuban Americans, so on and so forth. And I've had this experience where so many of my students say, I can't really find my family or my heritage or my people in this US history textbook. Can you, can you tell me what happened, like where we went, like how we vanished? And to me, when I started having that experience, it just mirrored the experiences I had when I was growing up. And as scholars, we think a lot of things have changed um, since the 1960s. And we've had an amazing 
you know, group of people who taught, you know, progressive histories. We've had people like Howard Zinn, People's History of the United States. Um, we've had Angela Davis. But unfortunately, the changes that really needed to happen on the local level, in many cases, haven't happened. Our, our textbooks are still whitewashed, to be honest with you. And so when I teach a class and I come to a, a period, uh, a moment in the U.S. history textbook where it talks about how the U.S. was an isolationist nation until 1898 or maybe until World War II, my Haitian American students jump up and say, no, I mean, the U.S. was involved in Haitian politics from the 1790s. Um, my Cuban students say, no, the U.S. was involved in promoting the slave trade in Cuba in the early 19th century. How could it ever have been isolationist? So part of this is a lot of the book is rooted in my classroom experiences and dialogue with students as a community organizer when I worked with the United Farm Workers and I had to learn labor history and learning really quickly that the labor history of the farm worker movement was not in the textbooks. And so all of these things missing. And the final thing I'll say is that, you know, I'm in a culture, in an academic culture where a lot of people um, talk and worry and complain about the rise and, and the resurgence of white nationalism. And we live in a time when white nationalism is resurgent in the United States and frankly, throughout a lot of the world that we live in. Um, but it strikes me as odd that as historians, we, we haven't done enough to challenge that. And so one of the things I do in African American and Latinx history of the United States is to say, <clears throat> from the very beginning, this has not been a white nation. It's been dominated by white elites, but from the very outset, people from Latin America, from the Caribbean and Africa have played a central role in democratic struggles, anti-slavery movements, trying to create bridges, build bridges between freedom movements in the United States from the colonial period uh, all up, 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 up into the present. And we ignore that at our peril. If we, if we ignore the linkages between the United States and the nations of Latin America and Africa and the Caribbean, then what we will get, we'll continue to get people who can easily seduce us by saying, oh, we'll build a wall because you know, building a wall is gonna make us safer when really the history of this entire hemisphere is people trying to build connections between uh, each other. But many times those connections have really frightened our elites um, and they're able to kind of spread this fear throughout the rest of the society. So that these are some of the things the book is trying to address. I think one of the things, like there's people not getting excited about who's running for 2020 and great, but I mean, on the democratic side. And one of the things just to, to your point is I'm actually more worried about who locally people even understanding genuinely how we, we got here. Um, and so that is fundamentally, everything you're speaking to is we've gone generations with woefully incomplete. It feels like even the word incomplete isn't even enough. Really intentional, um, as you said, whitewashing of how we got here as a country um, and, and really leaving out violent, the role of violent extractive capitalism uh, that we continue. And so, uh, you know, thank you for this book. Actually, can't, I have not read it yet and I can't wait to get it. Um, and so we, we, there needs to be like a fundamental education that happens amongst, among adults along with our, um, our youth and, and children to really kind of change the ship because there's a whole vast segment of this of the US population that is frankly willfully ignorant. I, I don't think anymore that the information's there if you want it. Um, uh, but but there's a genuine willful ignorance that is it's dangerous. I mean at this point we, we need to name it for what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if it's if it's ignorance as as it is I would go a step beyond that. I, I think it's it's not even just propaganda, it's actually indoctrination into a specific way of thinking about our country. Um, so, you know, when my sons are in high school and the past two years, I've looked for an ethnic studies program for them for the summer, even just a week at a college, at, you know, somewhere um, where they could go and, and learn, you know, what some of the ethnic studies courses in college um, are able to bring in that our high school, um, you know, classes don't even have, and it's not even out there, like for high school students, you know, the, the, there, I think there was one, maybe two programs. I mean, it was just 
it's not even there if you know that you want to go and find it. Um, so, you know, I, I love that, Paul, what you're doing in, you know, bringing these texts um, because I'm able to, you know, take this and, and people's history and, you know, miseducation and, and bring those books to my kids. But it's a different experience when you are sitting in a classroom being indoctrinated with a specific um, viewpoint as when, you know, I bring these texts to my kids and say, sorry, this is part of what you're going to be doing this summer. <laughs> you're going to be reading this. <laughs> and I try to make it exciting and, you know, you know, some payoff for them, but it, it's, it's just different. Well, it is an exciting history because it's, it's a movement history. It's people in motion, people in struggle. And another thing I've really learned from the classroom, which kind of mirrors my own upbringing is, you know, when I was a kid, when in my household, when we talked about the revolution, we were always talking about the Mexican Revolution because that was the revolution that, which really impacted my family much more than the American Revolution. I mean, we never talked about Alexander Hamilton or George Washington or all these people that are, are so big now or Jefferson. I mean, we talked about Emiliano Zapata. We talked about Pancho Villa. We talked about the struggles for land reform in Mexico. Um, one of the things I learned too, getting back to an earlier point that, that several of you have made, yes, it isn't just ignorance, which is at play here. Many people have known the facts that are in this book. And I just wanna highlight the importance of Beacon Press and, and the Unitarian Universalists for supporting Beacon, you know, since the, the years of the anti-slavery movement, because Beacon Press insisted to me that in writing this book, it had to be free of jargon, it had to be concise, it had to be accessible to a general public, because, you know, at this late stage, you know, we're in a crisis right now. I mean, and one of the issues we've talked about ad nauseum is the hostility between our government and the government of Mexico. And in, in this book, in chapter two, we go back to the turn of the 18th century, actually. We talk about the importance of the Mexican War of Independence and how, what an enormous impact it had in the U.S. in so many different ways. One of the impacts is that Mexico abolishes slavery very early on and becomes a place of sanctuary for African-American slaves in the United, fleeing the United States. And it's, it's such, you know, Mexico is such an inspiration and democracy for people worldwide that when the U.S. invades Mexico, finally, uh, we, we call it in the textbooks, the Mexican-American War. It's a terrible, um, uh, again, worse than ignorance. It's not the Mexican-American War, it's the U.S. invasion of Mexico but many of the US soldiers that go down to Mexico to overthrow the, 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 the country, to take over the country, many of them actually join the Mexican side. Um, an entire Irish regiment is formed actually. Um, and I got a chance to see there the wonderful memorial um, uh, in Mexico City um, over December. Um, my wife and I were actually in Mexico City in part to pay homage to the San Patricio Battalion. Uh, these were Irish American troops when they got to Mexico during the war, they said, hey, we're, uh, we're fighting on the wrong side. And so they ended up fighting for the freedom of, of Mexico from US imperialism. Um, but that example of freedom and democracy and justice in Mexico, we, we, use, uh, uh, we talk about people like Frida Kahlo, uh, Diego Rivera, uh, Jean Charlot, so many people, the Zapatista movement of the 1990s, so many Americans have been inspired by those movements. Uh, the Mexican Revolution, um, I have a friend, Christina Heatherton, who's finishing a book now, which argues that the Mexican Revolution had a much bigger impact worldwide on promoting democracy movements than, than the Russian Revolution in 1917. These are the things that, that I think many of our elites like Donald Trump are really afraid of from Mexico. Uh, they're not really afraid of, of drugs or crime, I and mean, we have plenty of that for sure, but they're, they're afraid of these linkages that people make between the countries. I mean, young people especially are really into making those linkages. So why do our governments try to shut them down? Yeah, I just, as everyone knows, I was in Mexico City for a month this year and I was blown away by the museums, by the perspective, by being in a place where I didn't have to be going against everything, the museums and, you know, it was with me, it was, you know, there's a whole museum of American invasions. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it is. And I was like, 
when I said I was going, people were like, oh, it's dangerous there because that's, <laughs> I think it is dangerous <laughs> to capitalistic America. Yeah. But yeah, well, that's yeah. really exciting. I didn't know about, I'm Irish, so I'm really excited about the Irish battalion <laughs> switch yes. sides. It's one of the things, you know, when I, I was in the military for four years and, and including special forces in Central America, and when I came back, Howard Zinn's People's History was one of the first books I read. And uh, Howard has that wonderful, th there's actually a whole chapter where the, the, the San Patricio Battalion is a, is a part of that story. But yeah, I mean, going to the Secretary of Education um, building uh, and three stories of Diego Rivera, uh, Siqueiras, Jean Charlot, these amazing murals of African descent people and struggle um, of indigenous people, the, the history, the pre-European history of the nation, so important. And realizing, wow, we just don't have anything like that in the United States. We have so much we could learn from people from Mexico, from countries like Trinidad, if you've ever had the chance to go to uh, Trinidad, or I know increasingly people have been uh, going to Cuba, but I mean, these are nations that we have so much to learn from. And what I'm trying to do in African American Latinx history of the United States is just to give people a sample of how the people from these nations have intersected uh, with US history from really the very beginning. Um, this is Marguerite. Lee. I'm, I was really excited in your intro, you mentioned um, Haiti, Haitians, and you know, which is, I'm, I'm Haitian, so um, we're all aware of how little we're talked about unless, you know, um, the old reference, both people and so on. So, so I'm really interested in reading your book, and I just kind of wanted to know if uh, part of the Haitian history with regards to uh, slavery uh, is mentioned in your book. And if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, I'm so glad, Marguerite, you mentioned that. So chapter one is titled The Haitian Revolution and the Birth of Emancipatory Internationalism. And the argument here is that for oppressed people in the Americas, the Haitian Revolution is much more important than the American Revolution. And Haiti actually plays a role in the American Revolution, kind of parenthetically, actually sends a volunteer regiment of, of infantry uh, soldiers who play a critical role in the Battle of, of Savannah. And I was actually at Savannah uh, just a few years ago. And if, if your viewers or listeners have never been to Savannah, there's a beautiful, one of the most beautiful monuments I've ever seen in my entire life is right across the street from the first African church in Savannah. Uh, the first African church was founded around 1777. Um, it's the oldest, we think the oldest continuously um, congregated uh, African-American church in, in actually North America. And, but that monument is a monument dedicated to the hundreds of men from Haiti who actually came to, to uh, serve with uh, the Continental Army to fight against the British. The irony of that is that they were fighting against a British general who later would lead an invasion force from Britain to Haiti to try to re-enslave the Haitian people. That was General Maitland, one of the ironies of history. Um, Haiti, once the Haitian Revolution happens, and it's the only successful slave revolution in human history. Um, we need about 20 movies about it, you know, and, and just to kind of educate people. But it's so pivotal because every early slave revolt that happens in the United States keys in some way on the Haitian Revolution. Every Latin American independence movement from the Mexican War of Independence to Simon Bolivar in Central America to the struggles in Argentina um, and in that part of South America, key on the Haitian Revolution. What I mean by this is that people like Simon Bolivar, uh, Jose Marti, Antonio Maceo from Cuba, all end up in, Cuba, uh, in Haiti, <coughs> excuse me, at some point for sanctuary when the Spanish or the Portuguese or the Dutch or, or the French defeat them, Haiti is that place that guerrilla freedom fighters like Jose Marti end up staying and learning from the Haitians. The Haitians have something very important to teach Latin American independence movements in the, uh, in the 19th century. What I mean by this is that Haiti is the only nation in the hemisphere which has defeated the Spanish, the British, and the French. They, they defeated two major French invasion forces, so they teach people, they teach freedom fighters from Mexico, from Central America, um, how to 
uh, equip armies how to to win in combat against superior forces you know who have rifle artillery um, but more important than that one of the one of the amazing things is is how we've forgotten so much of this history but if you take a country like venezuela for example the first time the venezuelan flag was actually flown uh, was around 1806 1807 not in venezuela proper because the spanish still dominated that that area what was going to become venezuela but it flies in Jacmel bay in haiti and the haitians celebrate this fact and they're very proud of the fact that again and yet another independence movement has come to haiti to to for for sanctuary and for refueling uh for refitting at the same time the countries of europe great britain france and the united states are united in one thing they see haiti as a contagion of liberty and that's the phrase that they use and my students are always amazed about this because up to this point france and great britain the us are always at odds right they, they fight wars with each other they're constantly in conflict, but there's one thing all the great European imperialist powers can agree with or agree on is that Haiti, we, that they need to draw a blockade around Haiti uh, because it's, it serves as a dangerous lesson on how oppressed people can get their freedom. And this is why despite the Monroe Doctrine in my classes, <laughs> in my classes, we've learned a much different take on the Monroe Doctrine. Again, because the experiences of my students the Monroe Doctrine is supposed to be a, 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 a promulgation, if you will, where the U.S. tells Europe hands off the Americas. That was never the case. The U.S. helped France force the Haitian people to pay slavery reparations for over a century. Um, and essentially, the way that the Americans participated in this but was by saying, we will withhold diplomatic or any kind of trade um, rep, um, relationship with Haiti unless you promise to pay this crippling um, slavery reparations to, to France for, for abolishing slavery in Haiti. <clears throat> Great Britain joins along and even during those times that Great Britain and France are at, at each other's throats, again, they're trying to strangle Haiti from the very beginning because even to this day, I mean, in, in the book, I mean, I talk about, I mean, all through World War II, I mean, here's another example that's not in the book, if, if I can, can kind of switch gears just a little bit. In, in the late 1930s, before World War II has started in Europe, there was a, a, a global conference held on the crisis of Jewish refugees. This conference was held in France. And all of the major European powers in the United States said, uh, well, you know, we feel very bad for what's happening to those poor Jewish people. Uh, but the US delegation says, you know, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, we'd like to do something, but we're a nation of laws. We have a quota. We can't really do anything. Does that sound familiar, right? We would like to help, but we're a nation of laws. And one after the other, the Western uh, so-called democracies say the same thing. We would like to help these poor refugees. But we just can't do it. We're, we're all nations of law. It's interesting how that, that phrase is, is, is invoked very selectively. Um, two nations step up and say, you know, we're very under-resourced, we don't have navies, but we would like to do something, and we're going to pledge to do something. And one of those nations is the Dominican Republic, the other nation uh, is Haiti. <clears throat> and the Haitian delegation steps forward and says, we will accept as many Jewish refugees as you can help bring to our island nation. And tragically, France and the United States step forward to, to, to prevent this from happening. Because again, Haiti has made us look so pathetic, so anti-democratic, uh, so racist, because and, and so anti-Semitic, right? Racism and anti-Semitism really go hand in hand in the history of this country. How I found out about this was quite by accident. I was reading a Jewish newspaper uh, based in Montreal, Canada uh, in the 1950s. And in this Jewish newspaper, every year there was a ceremony and a, a proclamation from the Jewish community in that part of Canada thanking the Haitian people for this gesture. Because even though the US and France blocked them from doing this uh, before World War II started, it, um, uh, Haiti still accepted a certain number, was able to actually provide sanctuary to a certain number of Jewish refugees during World War II. 
and the Jewish community in Canada wanted to, to thank them you know, for their, their efforts. And again, I think of, of the United States, which prides itself, which on one hand we say we want to be a nation of immigrants, of welcoming refugees and the poor. Uh, and yet again, uh, we, we came up short and students should know this. And, and we should, when, when people use phrases like a nation of laws, people should understand what that really means, right? Yeah, you ask if, if that sounds familiar, and it, it does, except that I don't think we've even, uh, we don't even pretend that we actually care to help anymore as a nation, which is sad. Um, like there's not even lip service to the, oh yeah, we'd like to help, but uh, which it's just sad. And, you know, it just, there are so many examples <coughs> of how this sort of American mythos of, you know, which is a, a white supremacist story um, has hidden uh, things that we all should be, should be, should know about. I'm curious, Paul, it sounds like you're, you really let your students teach you a lot. And, and I'm curious, you know, cause you're kind of, I mean, what I hear from professors is you're kind of working with the same age of people coming through year after year. I, I don't know if that's true of your particular job, but, but I'm curious what, what you see and how the students are thinking. And do you see changes developmentally? Do you see, I'm just curious what you see, because it looks like you're looking really closely. Well, there, there's, I'm glad you asked the question, because I think there's an openness now among students and high school teachers I mean, I found in, I mean, this book has been out for uh, a little over a year now. And I, I went to some of the usual suspects, you know, I'm speaking at uh, Harvard this spring, NYU, uh, UCLA. So, you know, kind of use, uh, university um, gigs, if you will. But I'm doing a lot of high school workshops with social studies teachers, with high school students in places like Watsonville, California. Um, I was at Montgomery County, Maryland, working with 71 social studies department chairs. Montgomery County, Maryland is a district which services about, I think, 170,000 students. And I was so inspired to, to be there because the teachers, the administrators, the students were saying, we need to change the curriculum now. The curriculum that we have, and, and for them, the precipitating uh, moment was to realize, hey, we become a majority minority district. And we have to begin to change the way we teach. <clears throat> what was inspiring about this was on, you know, we went chapter by chapter in the book and the teachers wanted primary documents. They said, we, we want to teach our students and get them, you know, get their hands on, you know, primary documents. One of the most exciting documents in the book when I was doing research on the book was a letter that Jose Maria Morelos, who was a former priest turned revolutionary general, in the Mexican War of Independence, writes to President James Madison. And it's, it's in Spanish, he writes, uh, uh, Morelos says, hey, y'all just fought a revolutionary war against European tyranny a few decades ago. We're doing the same thing now. Just imagine if Mexico and the United States could form a coalition and an alliance, we could deal with these greedy predator European powers who are always trying to, to, to get us, right? Um, the British have just marched into the U.S., the nation's capital, and burned it to the ground. Hey, that's that kind of sucks, you know. Um, but if we formed an alliance between the two nations, just imagine what we could do, you know. And so it's documents like that. And I found in this incredible openness in Montgomery County to that kind of learning. And during the breaks, teachers would come up to me, you know, an eighth grade teacher would say, hey, I was just hired to teach women's studies at a middle school. And another teacher would come up and say, hey, I was just hired to teach Asian American or African American studies to ninth graders. And I would think, wow, that's amazing. That's incredible progress. You know, it's not uniform, but I guess what I'm saying is I'm seeing this more and more. There is an openness. You know, students, uh, earlier we talked about ethnic studies. Ethnic studies has really uh, growing leaps and bounds. Um, and it's kind of a, I'll call it a democratic backlash because <clears throat> Earlier in the decade, there were a lot of attempts to ban ethnic studies, and um, some of them even were successful. That 
created a backlash among parents, among students, among teachers and communities um, to where, well, what's so dangerous about learning uh, if, if you have a school district, which is 90% Mexican American in Tucson, Arizona, what's so dangerous about learning Mexican American history? Um, who doesn't want that taught? And again, it gets back to what we were saying earlier. It's more than just ignorance. It's kind of a gerrymandering of history, which has taken place in the last 20 to 30 years. I think it's it was a response against works like People's History of the United States. Um, it was a response against the wonderful work that Beacon Press has promoted over the years. I mean, Beacon has published people like James Baldwin. Uh, Beacon published the Pentagon Papers. But there's always going to be a response, a reaction, I get, I, you know, if, if you will. But again, you know, getting back to your earlier question, more students now are taking ethnic studies courses. More students want to take labor history. That's another, you know, whenever I teach labor history, um, when I first moved to the University of Florida, people said, oh, Paul, people, no students are interested in labor. That That's just so, you know, maybe in the 60s, that would have been interesting. But the first day of the class every year, it, it, it fills um, because young people now have heard this and some of them have participated, you know, the fight for 15 and a union. And even in the state of Florida, that's become a big movement. So the connection between social movements, uh, which have happened. And one last story, if I could, if I could share, because it kind of gets to the high school age um, freshmen, if you will. I did a, uh, a history workshop with students in Watsonville, California last year. Um, on African-American Latinx history of the United States. And towards the end of our session together, um, the we kind of were huddling, the students you know, said, hey, hey, don't, don't let this out. But we're organizing a walkout in solidarity with the students in Parkland uh, because the, the horrific Parkland shooting had just happened. And I saw this all across the country, high school students doing the types of activities which we used to associate with college students being very sophisticated in their organization. And they asked me that, you know, they said, can you give us advice? And I said, look, you're organizing. The only advice I can give you is don't allow us older folks to control the spin um, and, 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 and the explanation of what you're doing. You know, you have to be up, up front with the media, tell them exactly why you're doing what you're doing. Don't let them marginalize you. Don't let them say, oh, these are students who just want to get a day off from school. You know, tell them exactly why you're doing this. You're doing it in solidarity um, with students who have suffered in, in Florida. But I'm seeing a level of, of activism and organizing, which very much informs a lot of the work in this in this book. <clears throat> I'm kind of blown away with the idea that um that you know James Madison just chose um, white supremacy and imperialism over uh, well we've made so many bad decisions and it feels like there's a collective karma we're all having to deal with because um, of every single like inhumane brutal decision made since the since um, Columbus got here and it just kind of breaks my heart I don't have a question I just want to say yeah. it's heartbreaking <laughs> Yeah, it is. And, and I, you know, what's what's heartbreaking about that, too, is I ask my students, I, I give them I, I give them the setup and, you know, the we you know they look at the letter uh, translated version and I ask my students, let's play this out to the end. I mean, how do you think James Madison will respond? And there sometimes there's kind of nervous laughter. People, the students are like, are you kidding? I mean, we know how he's going to respond based on our current dilemma. On the other hand, though, what I do in the book is introduce students to these these amazing freedom fighters. And even among, <coughs> excuse me, white elites, there's a remarkable story in chapter two during the Mexican War of Independence and where John Quincy Adams, and I, I know, you know, many of your, your viewers will be familiar with the name. I'm the son of John Adams, both presidents, right? And when John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State, um, he did very bad things. You know, he worked with Andrew Jackson, authorized the invasion of Spanish Florida, which becomes the first Seminole War, which is a genocidal uh, war against indigenous people. Um, I'll just interject that he was a Unitarian. Just interject that. Yeah. Well, and but and in here, here's the interesting thing. 
so he loses um, uh, presidential election to Andrew Jackson. Um, they become bitter enemies. And he's elected to the House. The, he becomes the U.S. House of Representatives, John Quincy Adams. <clears throat> and he ends up giving, and I highlight this in the book, to me, the most eloquent speech I've ever read. And, and I've read hundreds and hundreds of speeches among representatives. He gives a speech against the impending U.S. invasion of Mexico. And he holds the floor for hours. I mean, literally hours. And John Quincy Adams is kind of pours his soul out. He says the U.S. is a corrupt nation. There's only one reason why we're invading, we're planning to invade Mexico, and that's to, to reimpose slavery. And he says, if you go to Mexico City today, you'll find that as a, as a white American, you're gonna be despised because you have a rhetoric about freedom, but you don't practice it. In fact, you practice exactly the opposite. And when John Quincy Adams is making the speech, what we know is that other representatives are, are yelling at him. There's either they're saying, shut up, you know, sit down, you know, they're cursing at him. They can't believe that a congressman is actually speaking truth about uh, why the U.S. is getting ready to invade the country. To me, it's a remarkable moment in, in, in history. And um, it, it demonstrates the fact that someone, even someone like John Quincy Adams, can, can make a heartfelt change. But the backdrop, of course, is the anti-slavery movement, right? And it's the, the struggles at Harriet Tubman, that Henry Highland Garnett, uh, Sojourner Truth, uh, Frederick Douglass, and many others are engaged in. We talk, uh, I talk in the book about Baltimore as really a critical um, battleground of freedom. On the one hand, Baltimore is the key slave trading port between the, up, the upper um, South and New Orleans. Um, and it's an international uh, hub, if you will, of uh, profits based on slavery. On the other hand, Baltimore and the Eastern Shore of Maryland, that's the cockpit of the Underground Railroad. And that's the first place in which Americans learn what happened in what's happening in the Haitian Revolution. And year after year after year, there are uh, attempted slavery revolts in the Eastern Shore of Maryland. We know Harriet Tubman is from there, you know, Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnett. It was so inspiring for me, by the way, to give a talk at um, Washington College on the Eastern Shore of Maryland last year and to drive into this very small town, Chester Town, Maryland, I think, and to see Henry Highland Garnett School. Um, I was in tears because Henry Highland Garnett and his family, the Odyssey to to escape from slavery, to bring their children out of bondage, to have to learn how to take up arms to defend their freedom in New York because there were re-enslavers who were constantly trying to, to kidnap you know, African-Americans, whether they've been slaves or not, to sell them into Baltimore and, and, and New Orleans. But to see Henry Highland Garnett High School, I'm like, wow, this is so incredible. I never would have imagined this. Um, and those are the types of, of, of stories and vignettes. I mean what we owe Haiti, what we owe Mexico, the connections that ordinary people have tried to build to um, you know, the Cuban liberation movement over the generations. To me, um, those are just these incredibly inspiring moments. And I'm not suggesting that you, you remove James Madison or, or Thomas Jefferson or all these, all, uh, you know, these other individuals from history, you know, leave them in. But actually when you factor in our movements, the women's movement, the, the civil rights movement, the, the, the black freedom movement, suddenly those founding figures take on a completely different um, shade, if you will. One of the things that drives me mad, by the way, is when I turn on like NPR and I'll hear something that we'll, someone will say, well, in 1919, the United States government granted women the right to vote. And I tell my students, no, 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 the United States government never granted women the right to vote. Women fought for the right to vote. Uh, many of them were in prison. Some of them were tortured by police. Uh, they were beaten. You know, they fought generation after generation. They earned that right to vote working in, in social movements. Other times I'll hear, you know, African Americans. And, and I'll just add in that it wasn't all women. Exactly. And and they'll say the same thing about the Civil Rights Act. The United States granted the Civil Rights Act. And I'll say, no, that's not really what happened. Because again, when I look out of my classes, um, sometimes you know, 85% women, people of color, first-gen students, <clears throat> and I'll just, I'll just say, hey, 
Alexander Hamilton had no love for us guys. I just want to let you know that. I mean, I, I hate to, to go up against, you know, the popular uh, vis- version, but um, here is a person who, and, and he's in my book, you know, Alexander Hamilton's there, uh, but he's not singing and dancing. He's, he's arguing that the U S needs to, to re-enslave the African-Americans who have found freedom in evacu- evacuating with the British. So what I'm trying to get across, I guess, is that we could, we could have a new kind of, of, of history with people like us uh, in the history. You know, it's important for our, our students, especially thinking of the, the, the siege that African-American communities and immigrant communities are under. I think it's more important than ever to say that we've been here from the very beginning. Um, you know, we used to say back in the old Chicano uh, movement days, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And but I think metaphorically, that's true ab- about so many of our people's histories. And instead of asking people to assimilate, let's ask people to relearn our connections to the global South. I think that's so true. And I, I love one of the reviews um, on Amazon of your book. One of the people uh, who's reviewing your book said, um, it's a great read and it will, it, they say it's a great read, but it will piss you off. Um, right. And and I just thought that was such an, a great encapsulation of, yes, we need to go back and relearn that history. Yeah, it'll piss you off if you have your uh, emotional investment in the in the narrative of history that is popularly taught certainly <laughs> well the, the history of mass movements is is a history which can be you know infuriating when you learn about how people try to kind of x them out but at the same time inspiring my students will ask me why did we have to wait to college to learn about how the civil rights movement was really organized and i i know that one of your next i think your next guest Coming up, Desmond Mead, who I know very, very well, the, the, the lesson of the Amendment 4 campaign in the state of Florida. We learned so much about history uh, and we invoked history in, in that petition drive. You know, we had to get a million signatures um, on this, this, this ballot measure to reenfranchise people who have been convicted of felonies. And we drew from the lessons of all of these past social movements on how to work together across the state. You know, we, we learned that we were not gonna get a million uh, signatures on this felony reenfranchisement measure by going to the county fair with clipboards, okay? We had to go to the Miami Dolphins football game, the University of Florida football game, where a lot of people were very hostile to us. And as Desmond can tell you, um, it, was a, it was a campaign very much informed by history um, and it turns out, you know, it's the largest reenfranchisement of, of, of people in American history. It was really a remarkable struggle. Um, and Paul, I, you're doing a great job foreshadowing next week when we're going to have Desmond Mead and Patrice Curtis talking about this reenfranchisement. We just have a couple more minutes. And I wondered uh, for closing question, you know, what what do you wish that people would get from the book? Like what like your dream of what? How you? Because I can just see why students would fill your classes immediately. I think we're all sitting at your feet, you know. But what do you what do you wish that everybody would know? Well, I wish kind of um, the kind of curiosity that a lot of my students and people that I talk to, you know, we we develop a new curiosity, uh, if you will, about people in the world around us. And when we think about going to a place like Mexico City, for example, um, people don't fall into cut it into pieces and say, oh my gosh, it's so dangerous there. You know, are you sure? Do you want to go there? Or to 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 a place like uh, a nation like Haiti um, or other places which we should be building connections to. So to me, I think, you know, using the book not just to learn the kind of history which I wish I would have learned as a kid, but also uh, using history to connect us to people around us today, you know, whether it's people in our own communities, we may not speak their languages, but hey, what about learning a little bit of that, uh, a little bit of that language? You know, we may have a different lifestyle, but what about, you know, learning something more than toleration? You know, we talk a little bit about that. You know, what does it mean for you to tolerate me? Wow, that's really nice. But, you know, let's genuinely learn 
something of each other's um, history. And that, that way we might be able to, to actually talk with each other. One of the exciting things is to see the book being used in a lot of um, discussion groups and you know, kind of small groups where people are talking about truth and reconciliation. And there's a lot of exciting truth and reconciliation efforts happening, by the way, in the Deep South, um, in Florida, um, and in other places that had anti-Black racial pogroms. I'm hoping that people can use the book to kind of come together, you know, across, um, you know, across differences, across demographic, you know, differences, if you will. And so um, that's all very exciting because it's not just what we learn about the past; it's how we 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 use the past to kind of build more solidarity in the present. That that's my my hope for the book. Well, thank you, thank you so much. This has just been wonderful. I feel alive. <laughs> that's what history should be exciting. You know, history should be passionate. And it should be. I always hate, uh, I, I, this is my hobby horse, but I hate when people say, oh, it was so boring, history is so boring. No, history should make you laugh, it should make you cry. There's so much tragedy, there's so much amazing, powerful triumph in, in history, but it should never be boring. So let, let's, let's not do it that way. Let's not, I wish you'd been in my high school class. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks to Beacon Books for producing this. I hope everyone goes and buys it. Jess, did you promote it over on the Facebook page? I sure did. Great. So Thank buy you. the book. Yeah. And thanks so much. And Paul, maybe you'll come back sometime. I have a feeling you didn't say everything you know. <laughs> I would love to. And, and I apologize. My, I'm still recovering from the flu like Michael. I guess we got it in grad school, right, Mike? We've had it for <laughs> decades. But um, yeah, thank you so much for, for having me on. Maximum respect to you, you, Beacon Press. You know, wonderful community. Thank you. Thank you. So long. Bye-bye.